Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the President's Task Force on Education, Outreach and Engagement. Welcome to today's Unemployment Assistance Webinar and I'd like to introduce sag after President and your host, Gabrielle Carteris. Oh, thank you, Pam. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, before I start, I uh, want to just say I hope that you're all healthy and doing well. Um, this is really an incredibly challenging time, and it's actually in some strange way, but it's true. It's comforting to know that we're all together in this moment. So I just wanted to share that with you. I, we are actually anticipating almost 4,000 participants to join us, and that will be members and union leaders from across the country. So we welcome everybody. Um, this webinar is about unemployment assistance and the expansion of the assistance to the CARES Act that was just implemented last week. I just have to take a moment to start by thanking the members and the staff and the, the union leaders, uh, industry leaders from across the country who worked actually with state and federal officials to ensure that the entertainment industry workers were included in the recent CARES Act. This was something that was possibly not going to happen and because of the work of so many people from around the country, um, we are seeing something that is so important to the workers in our industry. Um, not only are we gonna be talking about unemployment assistance and how it works, but to recognize that the CARES Act actually includes a $600 a week increase for the next three months. That's on this stimulus bill alone. If there's another stimulus bill that comes along, We'll see what happens there, but we want to make sure that you're fully informed, that you're empowered, you understand how it works. Um, this is going to be actually one of several uh, important webinars that we share with, um, with you as we move forward through this pandemic, which has um, been so disruptive in all of our lives. Um, it's really our hope that we can help to empower you with as much information as possible to help you get through this time. We really this is something that if we really work together, stand together and learn together, we can get through this. We will get through this. And I just wanna say thank you for joining us. Thank you for everybody who made this happen, the staff that's made this happen. I want you to know they've worked tirelessly to um, help keep us informed and engaged and to protect us. And we will always be grateful for that. So uh, without further ado, I would like to actually introduce uh, our National Executive Director, David White, who has been a stalwart uh, you know, leader uh, and uh, for our members, for this union, and actually for the industry. So David, please take it. Thank you, Gabrielle. And welcome to all of the members of SAG-AFTRA and to our guests who are also joining this seminar. We're really grateful uh, that you are here, grateful because it is essential that we not only capture benefits to make sure that the people we represent uh, are included in legislation, like the one that we are about to talk about, uh, but also that all of our members and all of our friends have the information needed to access those benefits once they have been advocated for and captured. I just wanna take a brief moment to talk about the power of collective action and the power of being a part of a collective, of a family. What the union does is, what we do, sag after, and what we have been able to do is to provide relief through a variety of ways, premium reductions, reductions in the amount of dues, et cetera, that come to the union, but also assistance. That's really critical if you have not already accessed information about funds that may be and resources that may be available to you through our foundation, the sag After Foundation, through other support organizations in the industry, like the Motion Picture and Television Fund, the Actors Fund, and others, we really encourage you to do that. That is the power of coming together and making sure that our voice is heard and that resources are brought together to be distributed. That's what we want for people to actually receive as much as possible to get through this pandemic. So I'm very proud of the team at SAG-AFTRA, but really I'm very appreciative of the coordinated collaborative efforts 
of entities across the industry, professionals across the industry, and in other industries, and to those who really understand this system and how to make sure people have what they need, like our guests today. So we have a panel of experts, and that's going to be led by our moderator, Mr. Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who serves as the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of SAG-AFTRA. And without further ado, Duncan, let me turn this over to you and thank all of you for being here. Great, thank you so much, David. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, your leadership on this has been amazing and we're really excited to be here today um, to present this panel. We have some amazing, amazing guest speakers. But before I launch into introducing them, I do wanna just say a couple of things. I think all or almost all of them are lawyers. So I'm gonna start out by saying everything we're saying today is educational and informational. It's not legal advice. So there, there can be no attorney-client relationship between us and three plus thousand people on the other side. So if you do need individual legal advice, um, then that's something that will have to be done outside of this webinar type setting. But we're really excited to provide all the information and share that information with everybody and hopefully provide some help. Um, also, uh, we are going to try to take some questions. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to have an, we not going to, we do have an email address. I'm going to put it up on the screen uh, here for everybody to see. And that email address um, is pteoe at sagaftra.org. And hopefully you're seeing this now and I'll hopefully make it bigger. So uh, with that email, you can send in any questions that you might wanna make sure that we try to address. I do wanna emphasize that um, we obviously are not gonna be able to answer everybody's question. What's going to happen is we have a, a team here at SAG-AFTRA who are gonna be calling through the questions, trying to figure out what the most common questions are and we'll do our best to address those questions. We also have a whole bunch of resources, resource links on the SAG-AFTRA website. Um, we'll show that uh, link to you in a little bit. And so if for whatever reason your question isn't answered, that may already be there in the resources we've got. And if not, we will post an FAQ, frequently asked questions uh, later on based upon the questions that we receive through the PTEOE email address uh, that I'm showing you right now. So without further ado, I wanna go ahead and introduce our uh, panelists. So let's do that. Oops, no, went ahead too fast, sorry. Our panelists are, number one, uh, from our legal department here at SAG-AFTRA, Sonia Augustine. She's an experienced attorney and handles unemployment uh, related issues for us here at SAG-AFTRA, uh, helping members and the union uh, address those. Second, we have Judy Conti from the National Employment Law Project. She's their government affairs director and has been instrumental um, in helping advance the cause with respect to the CARES Act and uh, is a tremendously knowledgeable uh, person on the policy side of the issues we're about to talk about today. We have two amazing guests from the New York State Department of Labor. We have uh, Rena Lada and Paul Mason. Uh, Rena is the Unemployment Insurance uh, Program Manager at the New York State Department of Labor. And Paul is the uh, Director and Unemployment Insurance Adjudicator um, there as well. Thank you to both of them for taking time out to be here. We know it's especially difficult for everyone who's running these unemployment insurance programs right now to take even a few minutes to talk to us is, is extremely appreciated. We also have an, a very experienced uh, labor law attorney from here in California, David Rosenfeld from the firm of Weinberg, Roger and Rosenfeld, which is one of the preeminent uh, labor law firms here in California, and then myself uh, as the moderator of the panel. So really excited to have this very august group of people uh, here to talk today. Um, we're going to start out by trying to sort of talk a little bit about what unemployment insurance is all about and what the process is. But before we did that, we wanted to see if we could collect some information on the people who are listening to this so we can somewhat adjust what we're saying to our audience. So we're going to give this a try. So um, what we'd like you to do is on your computer or on a smartphone or whatever device you might have, if you can, if you can't do this, that's fine too. Uh, we'd like you to let us know where in the United States you are participating from. And the way you can do that is by going to this website at meet.ps slash SAGAFTRA. So M-E-E-T dot P-S slash SAGAFTRA, no dash. And when you go there, it's going to present questions to you. We only have about four of them during the course of the presentation. This is the first one. 
And what we would like you to do is let us know where in the United States you reside so that we can get a sense of where the um, audience is that's watching today. Now, we do know, um, just so you know, that there is a, a bit of a, of a delay. It's like a, say a 10 second delay or something like that um, in the live stream from the moment we say something to when you hear it. It's not for us to bleep anyone, it's just the technology. Uh, but we should start seeing uh, responses to this uh, when everybody has a chance to jump on and answer. So it would be really helpful to us. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for people to answer that, I'll just say hello to everybody. Uh, hi, Sonia, Judy, Paul, Rena, David, hello. Hello. And when you guys say something, your pictures will show up to everybody. So I'm seeing them right now, but uh, everyone on the live stream, you'll see them as soon as, uh, as, soon as they start saying anything, so. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Great. Oh. Thank you, Sonia, for jumping oh. in. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Paul. Us, I yes. Say. yes, right. It's good morning yeah. here in California and good afternoon to you guys. And good uh, afternoon from the DC area as well. Ah, thanks, Judy. Okay, so um, so we're seeing a, a big chunk of uh, people participating in this uh, in this live stream are from California, also a very large portion from New York, and then a smattering from elsewhere around the country. We are going to have some specific California, New York related information as part of the webinar, but we do want to just emphasize throughout this process that unemployment is a state by state thing. And so when you go to the resource page at SAGAFTRA, dot org slash COVID-19. Um, there's a tab on the side for unemployment uh, information. And when you go there, we have a link that will take you to the unemployment uh, department's website for whatever state that you might uh, live in or jurisdiction that you might live in. And so that way you can have an easy way to find the correct unemployment uh, department for whomever um, or wherever you might be located. So, um, so great. So we had 335 people respond to this so far. That's great. It looks like it's still pretty much staying about the same. So I think we can rely on, on that information. So we're going to go ahead and get ready to move on to our next, um, to our next poll question. And our next poll question is, appears as though my screen is not being shared anymore. Sorry. Uh, I can't tell if that's correct, but I'm going to fix it right now. Here we go. Okay, so we're gonna go on to, um, so another question for everybody. How familiar are you with the unemployment assistance system? So what we'd like to know is, you know, have you um, worked with unemployment before? Have you filed unemployment claims? So you're very familiar with how that process works. Are you totally new to the system and really need a good, grounding and what that um, means and how it works. And it looks like we've got the vast majority of people are either not familiar or just a little or somewhat familiar. We don't have a lot of people on the call on the webinar who are very familiar. So we'll definitely try to make sure to step through that with everyone so that we're all on the same page as we go forward. Our next question, oh, for some reason that screen just closed on me. So, sorry, let me pull up my next question for you. Okay. The next question was, for those of you who might be familiar with loan out companies, how often do you work under sag after contracts through a loan out company? Um, this is relevant because it may affect some of the information we might share during the course of this presentation. Again, it looks like the majority of folks who are participating in this webinar don't ever work under a loan out company. And then we've got uh, some who do very often and then a few who are in the middle, which kind of makes sense because if you have a loan out company, you're probably going to use it as much as possible. So, um, so we will definitely touch on loan outs as we move along in the presentation. Um, and that will be great. Um, Duncan, it's Pam. Yes. Just letting you know that some of the slides are sticking. Uh, okay, um, thank you. Uh, meaning that it's not sharing right now, is that correct? Correct. About that. Uh, thank you for giving me the heads up on that. I'm gonna just stop that share and restart it so that we can um, see that better. Pam, we let me know if that's working better now. Yep, we'll do. We see the results and thank you for that. Great. Now, thanks for letting me know. And so then uh, let me just 
go ahead and stop that share for a second. And why don't we go ahead and uh, start talking about the sort of background of unemployment insurance and assistance, sort of what is it meant to do? What is it not meant to do? And I'd love to call on, first of all, Judy, if you could to just share with us a little bit about sort of the context of unemployment assistance. And then afterwards, I think David is gonna jump in uh, on that topic as well. Sure, unemployment insurance is generally a program that is available to people who are considered employees. That means you get a W-2 for your wages. And you generally can receive it when you have lost your job through no fault of your own, which, which really means that you aren't fired for misconduct. It doesn't mean that you can't be fired for maybe not performing up to standard. It, it really is something worse than that. It's your, you know, fighting with your boss, you're breaking rules left and right, you're, God forbid, you know, having fist fights with, with coworkers. Those are the kind of things that we think about as misconduct. Um, unfortunately, the unemployment insurance system is a program that was constructed in the late 1930s during the recession. And since this is an enter entertainment audience, you'll, you'll like entertainment references. It was really built for like the Ozzy and Harriet kind of days, where there was a single breadwinner who went out and worked 40 hours a week and, and brought home the money for the whole family. So there are unfortunately a lot of flaws in the system for today's workplace. And one's most relevant to folks on this call is states don't always do a great job with people who have mixed earnings, some W-2, some 1099. Um, and in general, 1099 workers are considered independent contractors or self-employed. Uh, so they are usually not covered by unemployment insurance either. And we'll talk more about later about how the CARES Act takes them in. Uh, the other thing to note is that the unemployment insurance system is very unforgiving to low wage workers and new entrants to the workforce. You have to have a certain amount of earnings over the past 18 months to even qualify for UI. So if you are brand new to the workforce, um, say you started working in December and then all of a sudden this hit, you probably don't have enough earnings to qualify for unemployment insurance under the regular state plans. So the CARES Act will help fill in some of those gaps and we'll get to that later. Thanks, Judy. Um, David, maybe uh, I think you had some thoughts you wanted to share a little bit about the historical basis of this that might help us all understand sort of how we move forward from here with the CARES Act. Yes, I've always been interested in the history of the Unemployment Act, and Judy referred to it. It's actually part of the Social Security Act of 1935. So there are two parts of the Social Security Act. One is Social Security, which you'll all be entitled to it someday, hopefully, the other part is unemployment. And it was 1935, there was no state that had any unemployment insurance regulations or statutes. Congress took care of that by taxing all employers and then telling the states, if you implemented an unemployment program consistent with federal law, you get that tax money back to pay for unemployment benefits. And lickety split within a couple of years, every state had implemented an unemployment program. The problem, as Judy refers to, is that each program in each state is different because there's not a lot of federal guidance about exactly what benefits to pay, how much to pay, although there are regulations about how quickly it has to be paid and other regulations. So the thing that your, this group needs to keep in mind is that these programs are state by state in many respects. What's interesting about the CARES Act is that goes away from that model and specifies who gets benefits and how much under the CARES Act. So there's some very particular provisions of the CARES Act. For example, as Judy referred to, independent contractors now can get benefits. People who were new to the workforce who expected or had a job have no earnings, and then that job is lost because of COVID-19. Now they're entitled to benefits because of the provisions of the CARES Act. So the thing to keep in mind is this is a state program, so we can't give you information about how Anna's going to do it, or California, New York, they're all going to do things differently. They're all struggling. And I just want to conclude by a, a statistic. There were over 6 million initial applications for unemployment benefit during the week ending March 28. Over 6 million around the country. There have been 3 million the week before. And you compare that to the 1982 recession. <laughs> of that recession lost for approximately 600,000 initial applications. 
you can see this is quite a difficult problem. And I just want to say something I'll say again is that all of you are probably entitled to some benefits under this act, under the employment system. You need to apply, you need to persevere, persevere, you need to continue to fight for your benefits, you need to deny, you need to appeal, you need to look for resources to help you with these benefits, but they're yours, they're part of the tax money, and you need to apply them. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Maybe we could start talking a little bit about what the process looks like for people who want to get that started. And we have a, um, what I would like to do is ask um, Judy to jump in on this and Paul and Rena, if you want to jump in as well. We have a flow chart that um, was intended to be multi-state. So it's, uh, it's a basic description of how the process works. And I'm going to put that up on the screen and then ask if, um, if possibly, um, you could sort of walk us through um, what that flow chart is. So everyone should now be able to see that. Um, Judy, do you want to kick it off and then we'll see if anybody else wants to jump in on that? Um, Judy, you're muted, by the way. Thank you. For those of you who have W-2 income, you're considered an employee and you will file for state unemployment insurance. And I know that the question for many of you might be what state, because you probably work in different states. You can apply in any state where you earned income, and the states do have an interstate compact where they work out among themselves all of the income you've earned from different states. And I am going to defer to our colleagues from the New York State Department of Labor to talk about that in more detail, because I do know it's a pressing issue for the membership. Um, Different states offer different benefits. Uh, you will not be surprised to know that, you know, the, the smaller southeastern states, the ones we typically refer to as the red states, offer very low levels of benefits, whereas bigger states, northeastern states, states with bigger cities, California, New York, um, New Jersey, offer much higher benefits. So you may want to Google um, maximum benefit level in New York, maximum benefit level in California, maximum benefit level in whatever state it is where you worked and see which one is the highest. Um, if you qualify for state unemployment insurance, you'll get that plus $600 extra per week, which is pandemic unemployment compensation. Um, and if you run out of that, then you can access additional benefits that Congress has authorized, including 13 weeks of pandemic emergency unemployment compensation and uh, perhaps pandemic unemployment assistance, which is a big program we'll talk about that is really applicable to self-employed people. If you go further uh, back up to the chart, you'll see that there are people who are 1099 workers or, or self-employed, um, or if you're both a 1099 and a W-2 worker. Um, we are hoping that states will put together one unified application for both unemployment, regular state unemployment, and uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance program, but it is going to be up to the states to how to handle that. Once a state verifies that you're not eligible for state unemployment, then you will be moved into this pandemic unemployment assistance program. And for those of you who work as independent contractors, if you're self-employed, if you are um, doing gig work on the side, like driving for Uber or DoorDash or something like that. Um, that is the kind of program that will be able to protect you as well. And as I spoke about earlier, if you're new to the workforce and you don't have a lot of earnings already, um, or if you're about to start a job that you can't start because of COVID-19, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program will be there for you as well. Fantastic. Is there anything that uh, Paul or Rena you want to add to that at this point about um, the process in general um, or anything specific to New York? Sure. I, I'll start. Um, I, first, I wanted to um, thank you for having us and our hearts go out to all your members. And we're all struggling to get this program up and running. It was signed into law about a week ago, um, but we have been able to implement the, the $600 um, on Monday. Um, we are in the process of taking applications. We're already taking applications for the, for the um, pandemic unemployment insurance. Those are for the people who don't qualify for, for regular UI. 
Um, and I just want to tell you that it, 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 we're still working on it. It is our goal to basically run that simultaneously. Basically, when you, there is the, the threshold requirement for any, any type of unemployment insurance is it for, or for the additional pandemic unemployment insurance is that you have to not be eligible for UI and you have to actually apply. So when you get an application, we will check to see if you have wages or earnings and that goes to the, the issue of if your employer has reported sufficient earnings and you're eligible, you will immediately go into benefits. You'd be eligible for the benefit rate. Our maximum benefit rate is 504 if you're looking at different states. Um, and, our, our, and on top of that, you will get $600. <clears throat> if, you're, if you're working part-time, our benefit rate would be reduced by 25% any day that you're working, and then you'd still get 600 on top of that. Um, the, for people that are already, that have, have, have been earning and, and have been receiving benefits in the past, because, and I, I've talked to some of your members, so I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with some of the issues. Um, uh, if, you, if you had exhausted your benefits uh, going back to July of 2019, you will be eligible for 13 weeks of extended benefits on top of the 26 weeks. And I say that because when you exhaust that period, then you'll be eligible potentially for other types of benefits, and, um, in including extended benefits. Uh, but, but the pre prerequisite is that, is that you're not eligible. So for those that are not eligible for unemployment insurance, if you're not eligible, we are going to send you an application by email um, we encourage people to file online. You'll get an email and you can upload all of your financial information right on the web and we'll begin to look at that so that we can look at both your unemployment insurance eligibility and your pandemic unemployment insurance at the same time. Um, that's a work in progress. I mean, we're literally, we're literally putting that in place now and we'll have more information on that. For gig workers, gig workers, I think um, you're all aware we had a major court case a few weeks ago, finding certain gig workers to be em employees. Um, we will be looking at those wages and entering those wages as employment. Um, those are going to be priorities. Um, so if you have, as as many as many of your members do, if you have work in in the entertainment business and supplement your work with gig work. Um, that will be work that you can use to establish entitlement for a claim. If you put those two together, that will, that will amount to what your wages would be. Um, I can get into the details of how you qualify at some point if you want. I don't want to get into too much uh, micro detail, um, but uh, those, are the, those are the basic interfaces. Um, and by the way, for pandemic unemployment insurance, you also get 600. Um, for either pandemic or for, for regular UI. Um, and that, that applies to the additional programs such as the Trade, Trade Act and the Shared Work Program. Um, but I think that the key is, is have your financial information ready and download it. We wanna look at that. We wanna be able to establish whether or not you're eligible for regular UI or whether or not you're eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. Thank you, Paul. I think one of the key messages that we're going to be delivering throughout this webinar is to, you know, figure out in which jurisdiction you should be filing if you are affected by um, unemployment as a result of the situation and go ahead and get in contact with your state's unemployment uh, department, file your claim, provide them the information. Um, don't let the sort of swirl of confusion that's going on around so much change happening in such a short period of time stop you from asking for the help that you need from that source and from the other sources that'll be on our resource page as well. But, and the good news I think, and hopefully all the panelists can confirm this, the good news is that no matter whether you were working on a 1099 or whether you're working on a W-2, you go to the same place to file for this benefit. And that is your state unemployment office in New York State, your office, Paul and Rena uh, in California, the Employment Development Department, other states. Again, we have the link on our website to every state's unemployment office. And that's where you go. So don't let confusion or concern about your status as W-2 worker or a 1099 worker or whatever stop you from going forward and, and seeking um, 
this assistance. And as Judy said earlier, under the CARES Act, there is new assistance available for people who've been working under 1099s. Um, whether they're wrongly classified or rightly classified, either way, um, that issue can be set aside because they can simply go directly to the unemployment office. And that'll be something that you'll, that, that you and your colleagues around the country will figure out as part of the process of um, taking care of that claim. Yeah, I, I, I would love to note as well that New York is the first and I think still the only state that's got this program up and running. They've done it in just epically spectacular time and fashion. We are trying to encourage all other states to follow their model. Um, and, and New York, as you know, is, is yet again ground zero for what's happening and with, the, the, with so many claims and so many people sick, stay at home orders. Um, so, you know, Paul and Rena from, from everybody at NELP and, and really all the unemployed workers in, in New York that can claim in New York, I'd be remiss if I didn't offer our thanks because what you've done is spectacular. Uh, and, and it's a model for the way the rest of the state's UI offices should be acting. Well, we really appreciate that. And I just, I just wanna say that um, I, I was around for 9-11 and um, was deeply involved in that and, and Superstorm Sandy. And this is, they were, they were horrific. I was dealing with a lot of the unions and that in those cases, the police and the firemen and so forth and, and different um, entities, but th this is touching every industry. And it's, it's, um, it's also touching our workers. And I just wanna give a shout out to them because they are, <clears throat> they're coming to work, they're doing all the work and it's, they're facing risks and that's something that's different, but people are committed in unemployment insurance. And we also have a tremendous outpouring of volunteers. And I think Rena, you would, uh, you know, we, we, we can't train them fast enough. That's, that's how much, that's how much support we have. So um, we, we really want to help all New Yorkers um, who are out of work um, and, and we want to get through this pandemic and through this crisis, um, but thank you, yeah. And if I could, um, we are getting a lot of questions and so I just wanna reconfirm this. I'm, I'm getting the word that we're getting a lot of questions for people who are watching the webinar right now. To be very clear, regardless of whether you are looking for the pandemic unemployment assistance, whether you're looking for regular unemployment plus the supplement, whether you're a 1099 worker, whether you have a loan out company, whether you're a regular, um, actor or broadcaster or musician who singer who's working for um, directly as an employee all of those people go to the same place to file these claims for any form of the assistance that we're talking about uh, today you don't have to go find a different government office to file it you go to um, the new york state department of labor to your unemployment department or to the appropriate one for your state um, that you're going to file in and you can find those links on our website but you don't need to file separately, that's something you do all as part of the process of filing uh, with the department. Is that is that correct as far as all of our panelists know? Yes. 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 Great. You can file, if you file in a state, for, uh, just to address that that earlier, earlier question, we have a c combined wage claim agreement. If you can file in any state where you had earnings and the states, we have agreements to um, sh send the wages um, if if you don't have enough wages to establish what we call entitlement, which is basically your earnings thresholds, um, you can supplement them with the earnings from another state. Um, and that is a process that we have to, I mean, all states are affected, but that's basically how states operate is they, they send the wage information, roll that up into one and, and use those wages. Um, and then you use the benefit rate and the eligibility requirements in the state that, that you filed in. And so you don't need to file any kind of separate application. Basically, when you file for whatever you're filing for, the, the CARES Act supplements, the PUA, et cetera, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, all of that is part of that same single application process. Is that, well, is that correct? There is a separate application. We're required to have a separate, separate application because there's different requirements, but we're gonna make that, we're working to make that seamless and all part of the web. Um, and we're still working on that is, is the answer. Rena, did you wanna? I just wanted to add one thing. Um, <clears throat> thanks for inviting us, first of all. It's, uh, thanks for being here. We're working with uh, um, claimants filing every day. Some are frustrated, depending on the situation they're in, but also our system is on overload, as you all know, everywhere in the country. This is unprecedented and we're not prepared for this. Um, 
we have, like Paul said, uh, added staff. We're training um, almost 100 at a time to get, um, get them on the phone and get claims. To add to what Paul was saying, um, this CARES Act program requires that states look at their own laws to make sure claimants don't qualify under state laws before they actually qualify for the pandemic unemployment assistance. So with that said, claimants do have to file in New York through our um, filing system online or on the phone. Um, we strongly encourage that they pr provide the wage information and they have it ready and provide it as soon as they file if requested because we need that information to rule out any possibility that they're, they're eligible for unemployment in New York State. If they do not qualify based on the wages or some of the other eligibility issues that are actually uh, accounted for in the CARES Act, then uh, we do transfer those claims to our specialists who would um, review that, that claim and then um, issue a determination based on the eligibility. Whether they are paid regular New York State unemployment or pandemic unemployment assistance, the 600 obviously would, would uh, be applied to every week they claim for benefits. Um, the only thing is, um, obviously, we want to help as fast as we can. We want to get these claimants as fast as we can. Uh, but sometimes we do need um, your help, again, to provide the information we need in order to get your claim paid. Thank you for that, Rand. I think that's such an important uh, point. And it is going to, especially in these circumstances, it is going to take uh, a lot of collaboration and uh, cooperation and uh, persistence for everyone to get through this. But um, clearly that's where we're going. I know, unfortunately, we don't have someone from the California EDD office on this webinar with us, but I do want to ask uh, Judy, Sonia, David, um, we expect the same process in general to be true for California, right? Meaning that you would go to the EDD for any of the types of claims that you would file under this in California that, um, again, you might have to, as uh, Paul mentioned, uh, there might be a connected application for the pandemic assistance, but that it would all be through the same office, through the same process. Is that our understanding based on our interactions with EDD so far on this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, that's been my understanding. Good morning, everybody. I've spoken to many of you. you we've been talking to you um, from SAG-AFTRA, and I hope you're all doing well. Um, the California website's being updated daily. I've just been checking it during this webinar. There's different information there from yesterday. Um, they're saying that they're taking two to three weeks to process applications and then you'll get information in the mail about your claim and your application. So it is unprecedented. We can't repeat that enough. Um, 10 million claims in two weeks is a tremendous amount of information for the system to process in all the different states. So every state's working on it. Um, there is new information on the California EDD website as of this morning it seems like there's also something called America's Job Centers where you can make appointments to help you fill out applications. That's new, I hadn't seen that yesterday. There's a link, you type in your zip code and so many places, um, apparently around at least California, the Los Angeles area popped up on my um, search engine. So that's new. So I think every state's trying to get up to speed with this, but yes, you go to your unemployment office website to make your application. You put in all the information, they're working as fast as they can to get that information processed and to get the letters out, I think in the mail is what I'm seeing, to give you your account numbers and information about your claim. That comes in two to three weeks, so you can have that information and then move forward in the process. So I think you should definitely check that website um, California EDD is the, if you Google it, it'll pop right up. And um, there's new information on there as of this morning. And, and every state will have, if not exact, a similar process. I'm going to just share a screen quickly, just to give you a visual to repeat what we're saying. 
you know, first the step one is the states are going to have to determine whether or not you are eligible for state UI. And if so, then they'll start paying the benefits. If you're uneligible, the state will then determine the eligibility for PUA. And generally speaking, there shouldn't be an additional application necessary, but there will be different information that is necessary. You'll need to produce some proof of your earnings, and it won't be a W-2. It might be a 1099 in part, um, prior year tax returns, pay stubs, affidavit. You can swear out an affidavit if necessary. I know a lot of times, um, like Uber and Lyft and those kind of companies, you'll get a statement with every bank deposit they make. And then the state will make a determination of PUA eligibility and begin paying those benefits if you're eligible. So there, there will be a relatively uniform process. Each state will have its own particular quirks, if you will. Um, but if you just want, if, if you're applying in states other than New York and California that we've spoken about, each state has its own name of its agency, but just Google Florida UI agency North Carolina UI agency, all of them will have daily updates um, because they're all trying to stand up these programs. Some will recommend that you start applying right away. And if there's any chance, if you've got any W-2 income and there's any chance that you're eligible for state UI, we recommend you start applying immediately. But if you know you have no W-2 income, it's probably better to check your state UI agency websites every day and only apply once they say that the, the pandemic unemployment assistance program is up and running. Though, though they will hold on to applications, we just, we wanna try to keep as much work away from the agencies as possible while they're getting things up and running. That's what most of them are asking of claimants. And beyond that, we just don't wanna take a chance that something gets lost in the shuffle. So wait till the programs are up and running if you know that PUA is your only possibility, um, but check the state websites daily. We really do hope that by next week or the week after at the latest, every state is gonna be up and running. We do know they're all working really hard and the Department of Labor is providing a lot of assistance. Can I add a, a few things to that, which is- Go ahead, David. Jerry remarked about the different state programs and if you're interested, you can actually get a lot of data and information from both the federal government's website, this is the Department of Labor, ETA, Employment Training Administration that runs the UI programs around the country. So if you really want to go to their website, you can learn a lot about the history of the program and how it currently operates. So for example, they keep track by a table of how much each state pays. And Florida's maximum is $275. Connecticut's maximum is 612. As Paul mentioned, New York's maximum is 405. Louisiana is 247. You can get a lot of really good information from each of the state websites by going to them. There's a lot of information there. You just have to bury yourself in it and Google and look around to find all this information about how the programs work and how they work. For example, on this 1099 independent contractor issue, that's long been an issue in the unemployment system. In 1935, when the unemployment system was en en enacted, the ABC test, as we call it, was an issue and used by most states, or many states, to determine employee versus independent contractor status. And each state has its own rules about who's an independent contractor, who isn't. And those state rules will apply in many cases to these unemployment benefits, but it isn't clear whether those state rules will apply the new CARES Act provisions or whether federal law is gonna apply. But you need to go to the websites to get all this information and to learn how to file these applications. I wanna also emphasize that it's gonna be frustrating and difficult sometimes. You're gonna to go to a website and try to enter the information and you're gonna to have to make some guesses and estimates. You have to have all your information there. It will be sometimes difficult because many of you have income in various states, income of various kinds, some may be 1099, some may not, but you just have to keep persevering and don't be concerned because your accurate, your information isn't clear. You're not sure of the answer. Put the best information in you can, complete the application. Don't worry about whether you had the right yes or no answer in some of these websites. Just do the best you can to get it done. 
because these benefits are extraordinary. Let me just make a historical point. Some of you may remember during the 2007, 2008 depression, government enacted, federal government um, enacted some changes to the unemployment system. And the primary changes at that time were just extending the benefits for 13 weeks at a time. And so the CARES Act extends the unemployment benefits for 13 weeks. But at that time, the federal government added a little amount to the unemployment benefit, $25 a week. The CARES Act adds $600 a week. That's an incredible amount different. I don't want to say it's an incredible amount of money, but it is $250 billion that's been allocated to the unemployment system. And that $600 lasts to the end of July. So you need to apply, you need to get it. But it reflects the fact that this CARES Act is a remarkable enactment by the government 98 senators voted for it, the president signed it, and it's got money to help workers. And I just want to point something out about all this, that this money is intended to help workers through this. But it also has another intention that people have mentioned. It's an economic stimulus. The idea is that workers will get the $600, their families will then spend the money, and that will stimulate the economy. And that was part of the reason for the Unemployment Act, the Security Act of 1935, was a stimulus to the economy. So you need to persevere, you need to apply. If you're denied benefits by the agency, every agency, every state has an appeal process. You should file an appeal, work through the appeal. There will be resources, petition and other, and other groups to assist you in that. But there's a tremendous amount of money that's available to you. If you don't, if you don't apply for it, you won't get it. Thanks, David. We had a little bit of trouble with the connection there, I think, at the end, but I think we got the gist of <clears throat> what you were saying, which is this is a significant uh, uh, change to the unemployment system to provide this additional benefit, and people really need to apply um, if, they're, if they are experiencing um, unemployment as a result of the pandemic, et cetera, and make sure that they get that benefit. I'm reminded um, by some folks uh, sending me some notes that we ought to emphasize that people also need to be very careful about the stuff they search out on Google and other websites because unfortunately there are scammers out there who are trying to take advantage of people during this incredible time. It's hard to believe that people will do that, but, but it is happening. And so it is really important to make sure that the websites you're accessing are legitimate and are authentic. They are the legitimate state government websites. You can go to sagafter.org. We do have the direct links to all of the state unemployment offices at, on our resource page at sagafter.org slash COVID-19. That way you know for sure you're getting something legitimate. But if you're Googling or if you're using other ways to find this information, just be, be careful and make sure that you are accessing authentic websites and not something that some scammer has put up. Make sure that the only places you're submitting your personal information, your financial information, are the legitimate state government unemployment department websites and not other places online because we don't want people to, um, to compound the difficulty of this time by being taken advantage of uh, by scammers. Um, I can see from the questions that are coming in that there's a, a very big question to be asked uh, about the Judy, you, you stated that perhaps people should wait until the states are up to speed on um, the PUA part of this before filing if they're only eligible perhaps for PUA, uh, meaning that they only are non, have non-employee compensation. Um, do we know what the status of that is in California right now? Um, and if it's not immediately apparent from the website, what do you recommend people should do in terms of deciding whether to go ahead and file their PUA claims in the state of California? Um, I'm going to actually turn this to turn this to Sonia because I know she's been looking at that website. But with with any state, I mean, go onto the website every single day. If it's not California or New York, or if it is California, because it's not up and running yet, but they will have updates on a daily basis. I'm sure because they really they're getting flooded with questions and they want to have everything available for people to take as much stress off their phones as possible. Yes, the California. EDD website, the, the information for employees specifically states that the state is in the process of implementing the new laws. So I don't believe that they've yet changed their software or the program, the platform that you um, go in to apply. I don't think that the PUA part of it is 
completely up and running yet. Um, it says specifically that they are trying to implement the system and they are working with um, the federal structures, the Department of Labor. We don't even know if all the money's been sent out from the Treasury Department yet to all the different states. I don't know how that process is working. So it takes a while for all of that to filter down to all the states. California specifically says we are working. Um, we've gotten overarching guidelines uh, from the federal government. We're working to implement it. That has been um, on the website for the last two or three days. That is still there today. So I don't believe it's, they've completely changed the system to take advantage of these new laws. Um, so they are urging patience and everybody knows we've been talking through it on the phone and we have to be a little patient and a little calm because it, it's a scary time right now. And, and we understand that. We really do. And uh, we're here to try to help you as much as we can, but the platforms simply aren't ready yet to take advantage of the sheer volume that's passing through the system. So we have to just be a little, a little patient. Paul uh, and Rena, can I, can I ask you, um, and I'll ask this of the other panelists as well. My understanding, I think, from some guidance I saw on your website is that um, people's claims can be retroactive to the date that they essentially lost their work, um, and that if they're delayed in filing, either due to the website being busy or if they need to speak to somebody on the phone, and that's being difficult because of overloaded lines or whatever, that they will be able to get their um, unemployment payments and whatever other payments they're entitled to from the program retroactively to the date they lost work. Is that is that correct? Right. They they we we will backdate those claims to the date that they filed them. Um, the only ca caveat that I've seen, I, I will just tell you this, is that there are some people. I just spoke with somebody. Um, you, the quarter ends on March 31st, and there are people that if they wanted to be backdated um, to that quarter. You, you, you always use the most, the, 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 most, um, the last complete, completed quarters. Um, that can be good for some people and not good for others, um, depending on whether or not they need sufficient earnings or whether or not that, um, that might kick their, their, their earnings, that might affect their benefit rate. And, um, but we'll look into that and advise people on that. Rena, did you want to add anything about that? I don't know if that came up with you, but we've gotten inquiries about that. Yes, we have, um, and it, it, this happens every quarter. It's not just this particular time, but anytime there's a change in quarters, um, someone could qualify for a higher rate based on the new quarter, or somebody could be better off keeping the claim effective, uh, you know, prior quarter because the way the wages are spread out through the last eighteen months could affect that rate. Um, the we are looking into it. We're trying to see what how to best capture this, even if the claimants are not. Uh, savvy enough to recognize it from the very beginning. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we do have a waiting period in New York based on regular New York state laws. Based on the CARES Act, that is going to be waived. So no matter when the claimants are able to complete their unemployment insurance claim in New York, we will retroactively make that claim effective to the first week they would be normally eligible for based on the last day of employment. And they will not have to serve that waiting week, meaning the first week they're eligible for unemployment, they will receive a payment. So someone could take three, four weeks to really complete their claim or get through our system. We will still automatically backdate it to that first week they would be eligible for. Well, the governor also previously waived the waiting week. So people that had filed early already were, were backdated and didn't have to serve a waiting week, right, right in the beginning of the process. And indeed, I've been informed that all states have now waived their waiting week. So um, any, anybody will be eligible from point of application. From the week they file, their effective date will be the beginning of that week, right? Yeah. Um, so with, with PUA, the eligibility can date back to January 27th. So for state UI benefits, it's backdated to the week of application, but the, the PUA benefits, one thing Congress did do is make that retroactive to January 27th. It doesn't mean you automatically get it all the way back then, but if you can demonstrate 
that your job loss, your income loss uh, was, was prior to enactment of the law, but after January 27th, you can get that backdated. But the, the PUC, the $600, can only be backdated at most to the last week of March. So the basic advice then would be try to get your claim filed and initiated as soon as possible. Um, through the online systems or through whatever mechanism is applicable in your state. And then uh, there should be the ability to, um, even if it takes a little while to get that claim process, to get the materials in, then you should be ultimately receive your unemployment payments for that time period. And in some cases, you may be able to go back further based on what Judy just stated regarding the, um, the special provisions in the law. Is that generally in the right ballpark? Yes. He nods. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I want to move on to a new topic, but before we do, I want to share the last of our poll slides. And I apologize for having to uh, share it because it's not, as, it's not good news. But we had, I'm hoping everyone can see it now, we had um, over a thousand of our um, participants answer this question, which is how much of your usual SAG after workload is available to you right now? And 80% of them stated none. Um, the other 20% are scattered amongst a little work, some work, most, or about the usual. No one is working more than usual right now. So I think that's pretty clear that, you know, this is not a scientific survey or anything. This is only the people who obviously are participating in this webinar, but um, it is something that shows the kind of level of impact that the situation is having right now and certainly explains, at least in a microcosm, why there's so much demand on the unemployment offices around the country right now. Um, I was hoping that we could turn to the question of residuals and other types of supplemental payments and how those are, are accounted for in the application process. Because we, I know we're getting, I can see we're getting a lot of questions from people about how, how does that play into your unemployment application? What are you supposed to do about residuals? And I think we probably have to focus this on California, New York, because I don't, unless other people know how it works in other states, but um, can uh, maybe Paul Arena, can you comment on that for New York? And then maybe um, Sonia, David, Judy, one of you could comment on it for California. Well, I'll just and tell you can... basically how the law works. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, before we move on, I just want to remind people that there's another aspect of the CARES Act, which is Congress says every adult gets a $1,200 payment. And so that means that you will get a check or deposit in your account $1,200 plus $500 for dependents. You need to keep that in mind that that's separate from all the unemployment benefits we've been talking about. Part of the CARES Act, if you're looking for that money based on your 2018 or 19 tax return. If you didn't file it, you file it immediately to get that money, but it's there separate from the unemployment. And I did want to sort of make that clear that we understood that's part of this whole Great, thank you, David. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Um, so the residuals are basically considered re remuneration. They, they can be used to establishing entitlement for your claim. Um, and it's important that they're reported. They should be reported. Um, they don't affect your, your benefits. One of the ideas of unemployment insurance is you're supposed to be totally unemployed or partially unemployed. Um, and it, it wouldn't affect your, your current benefit unless you work that week and nobody's working. So if, if you work and receive a residual at the end of the week, it would reduce potentially your benefit. But as long as the work is in the past, it can be counted towards your, towards your earnings. And in New York, you have to have earnings in at least two quarters and your high quarter has to be at least 2,600. Um, so you want all of those earnings to be included if there's, if there's you know, a 1099 that should not be a 1099, but should have been reported by the employer because it's misclassified, that would be part of, we, we look at all those different earnings. So you want to make sure those residuals are counted going to the question that you had. But if you're receiving them, we actually, people generally can't receive benefits if they're working and they're getting more than the, the maximum benefit rate, which is 504. But if they receive residuals based on work that they performed prior to that week, that won't be counted at all, regardless of the amount of that. Um, so I don't know, Rena, did you want to mention in the application process, I guess, 
we would just want to make sure that that money is counted towards the entitlement if there is an issue and it should be yes. reported if it wasn't. Yes, that is correct. Um, if it has been reported by employer, we would have it already based on the wage reporting system we have in New York. However, every claimant, once the claim is filed, will be sent documentation in the mail um, with the what we call the monetary entitlement determination, which shows every employer that's listed on their claim, every wage um, amount that's reported per quarter. So it's important for the claimant to look at it and see if that is accurate based on what they know they earned you know, those, those quarters. So if there's anything that they feel that is missing, that's what we're asking. Maybe the rate could go higher than what they have, could reach the 504 per week if they were to include those um, the 1099 you know, payments that were made based on residuals or, or other forms of uh, remuneration they've had. So um, it's important to review that for accuracy to help themselves and, and send that wage information. We do have a very convenient way of submitting that to us. Um, it's We strongly, strongly encourage that a claim be filed online. Uh, two reasons. Number one, uh, we have recently increased the capacity to handle the um, extremely high traffic we've had you know, through uh, the web filing. And so claims are going much smoother. We've also improved the questioning and the employer uh, employment records you know, uh, that they would have to report during the, uh, this process, especially for self-employed, for the gig economy employees um, to make this go smoother. And you know, if uh, they're, they're following certain criteria that we would uh, uh, auto, you know, automatically make them ineligible under uh, unemployment insurance laws in New York State, then they would automatically also be sent to the uh, PUA program. Um, additionally, if you file online, you are establishing an account with New York State. And through that account, uh, there's a lot of communication that's done electronically. Uh, if there's any information missing or we need um, certain things from the claimant, a message, a secure message is sent through that account. It goes right to the, the account. They also get the, uh, 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 an email advising that there's a message in their account. They can also, claimants can also upload information, wages, um, other documentation they might have. Sometimes we need identity documentation. There is uh, a step-by-step -step process that's explained. They can go into the uh, secure messaging system. There's um, a category there for submitting documentation. And under that, there's also a subcategory that says submit wage information. So by uploading their 1099s or whatever information they need to provide to us, that's instant and we can get that information quicker and, and try to resolve the claim quicker. Great, thank you. Sonia, can you comment on residuals in the California EDD and, and how you account for residuals in your uh, unemployment claim that you're filing in California? Um, yes, I do um, have one question that comes up fairly often and perhaps Paul or Rena could address this. Um, for the purposes of the last employer that a worker reports, could that possibly be residual income or does it have to be on the set in a session physically at a job? Do we know? I think it would be on the set because the last employer is usually the, the separating employer. In, in New York and and because what happens is people when they establish sometimes you have concurrent employment and I think a lot of your members do and we look at we look at the 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 entity that where they were separated from and that's the last day of work from that employer and can that last employer be outside of prior to the 18 month period the 18 month look back um, they wouldn't be, well, that's an interesting question. If they got paid, um, what, the way our statute works and it was changed, um, it becomes remuneration when, when paid to the individual. So it would likely be included, but I don't think they'd become chargeable because they would not be one of the employers. That's, I mean, that's actually an interesting question. I'll have to look into that. Um, you're right, that's a tricky, a tricky issue. Do you happen to know, Rena? I'm not sure about 
whether they become a base period employer. I just wanted to um, hear the question again because I didn't think I quite understood based on. Okay, so suppose there's a worker whose last job ended in October 2017. Does he or she count that employer as the last employer? In that case, if there's no physical employment after 2017, that person would not qualify in New York for regular unemployment insurance. The reason is because New York has uh, in the statute provisions that you have to have physical work in at least two quarters, right. which is your 18 month period in order to be having, you know, to have a, a valid claim. And those uh, residuals that did come in within that 18 month period, that does not count for the last employer. Is that correct? Correct. They would be included and potentially that claimant could be um, resulting with a value of money, a rate that we consider, because that still could be spread out uh, throughout the four quarters. However, again, there are certain provisions that need to apply in order for that claim to be valid. So monetarily, because that again, residuals we're saying are considered remuneration, can be used to establish the rate. So monetarily, they would be entitled to a, a certain amount per week. However, they would not be eligible because they don't have, they don't meet the other criterion of two physical, you know, uh, quarters, two quarters with physical employment. Well, they'd have to have other employment, but I think you were just wondering if they had other employment, would it be, um, would it, could it be used? Is that the question? Or are you just saying if they haven't, I mean, that goes to the issue of- the All residuals. That's the, that's the issue of showing attachment to the workforce, which is the basic tenant you have to have work in the last 18 months. You have to have physical work. Um, but there are two different concepts. If you have other work, there's one concept is whether or not you can use that to establish um, your, your, your wage threshold or your remuneration versus whether an employer will be chargeable for that. Um, and there's very, that's, that's a different question um, that gets into how that gets paid for. But yes, if you haven't, if your question is really just, if that's the last time you worked, um, I think, and I will say this, I read the guidance right before this again about the PUA. Even for PUA, they do require you to have some showing of an attachment to the workforce as well. So they would expect, I believe, that you have some work within the last 18 months. I don't know if we're gonna get more guidance, but, um, you know, people that have insufficient earnings, meaning they don't, they don't qualify because they haven't met those state thresholds, still could be eligible, but not if they haven't worked. Um, and 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 that's that's part of the unemployment insurance program that you, if you retire or you take yourself out of the workforce, you can't be eligible. Um, you have to always be somewhat attached. But Paul, I think so. The so to be clear, the point there though is any form of physical work. It doesn't necessarily have to be any particular type of physical work. If you have any work where you're actually working at all during that time period, whether it's connected to those residuals payments or completely independent of those residuals payments, then that will meet that requirement. And then I believe, according to what Rena said, all of those additional residual earnings can then be counted for purposes of determining what your benefit. That's um, correct. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there, you can, can, we, can, I, can I just point out a thing that is, sure. you did a little bit of work from home at some point. As part of that, you may well qualify, but under also the CARES Act, those who've been not part of the workforce, but are becoming attached to the workforce. And that example, you had residuals for two years, and now you had a gig that you were supposed to do in March or April, but got canceled by this then under the CARES Act, you're now eligible. Yeah, I, I, I think that, would, I, I like that interpretation and you're, you're probably right. I think um, we're still reading it um, because they just issued guidance a couple days ago. Um, yeah, there is a provision in the CARES Act that if you were about to start a job and you were not able to start that job as a direct result of COVID-19, you would be eligible. And that, that's kind of the exception to that, um, which we're hoping I mean, we all hope that it covers everyone, that everyone is, is, you know, as many as possible. And if you're eligible, then you are eligible for the $600 too, even if it's a small amount. Um, 
but you have to, I'll say the one downside, if, if you have no, no earnings, even under uh, PUA, which is, which is sort of governed by DUA, you have to have at least some benefit rate in order to get the, you have to have a, a minimum level of income. Um, in, in New York, it's 178, it's gonna be 182, um, but you can't get the 600 if you have a zero benefit rate after, after you look at the earnings. So there's a monetary issue that could be a, a roadblock as well. Well, the, the good news is that some of these states have very low benefit rates. I'm looking at Florida, um, very low. California is forty dollars. So even if you have a small benefit rate, you'd be entitled to the six hundred through the end of July. That is an important thing to keep in mind for those who have little work and a little benefit rate. Again, just emphasizes my point that please apply. Please go and apply if there's any argument at all. Thank you. So um, we have about 20 minutes left and I want <clears throat> to try and hit on a few of these frequently asked questions that are coming in right now. And Judy, I want to turn to you if I could <clears throat> and ask you about severance payments. What is the treatment of severance payments uh, with respect, and this comes up a lot, for example, with respect to our journalists um, or other members who are working on a regular basis. Um, are those severance payments just counted as wages for pur purposes of Unemployment, how does that affect an unemployment claim if you've received a severance payment? I'm gonna go back to something David said at the beginning. We have to remember that each state has its own laws that interpret a lot of how the unemployment insurance program is run. The federal government sets some, some minimum baselines but really give the states a lot of freedom. So every state could well treat severance just a little bit differently. As a general rule, severance payment is considered continuing income. Um, in some states, if you get it all in one lump sum, it is just that one lump sum is your last payment, and then you can be eligible for unemployment the next week. In other states, they will look at that lump sum and they will say, oh, this represents four months of regular income. So they will space it out over four months. And in four months, if you have not yet found a job, even though you're able, available, and looking for work, then you can start collecting unemployment. So it really will depend on how a state interprets um, severance pay and, and what they do there. And again, our, our friends in New York and Sonia may know more particulars about New York and California. Do you, do you want us to tell you? Sure, yeah, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I will let, Irina is absolutely an expert on this as well. She and I have worked on this from the beginning. <laughs> She's laughing, but um, basically if you earn more than the maximum, if your, your severance represents more than the maximum benefit rate, which is 504, then you are not eligible for that week. Um, and if you get paid, and, and or, or for any week that, that you're getting paid severance, if it's under 504, you it'll be disregarded and you get your full benefit. Um, one of the, the, the tricks here is that the law first looks at the severance agreement. So if somebody, if, if you write three weeks of severance represent one week in your collective bargaining agreement, will only make you ineligible for that one week. Um, if you just are paid a lump sum, we prorate it based on your earnings over the, over the based on your, 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 your weekly salary. So you, you'll be reduced for those weeks. If you're not paid for 30 days, and this happens with some employers, we disregard it as well. So those are, those are kind of the rules of the road in New York. Um, anything else, Rena? I think that's basically the uh, only thing I would add is um, dismissal and severance payments are not considered remuneration in New York. So if someone did lose uh, a job in the last 18 months and they were paid a substantial amount of money as severance, but they didn't have a whole lot of other employment, we would disregard that severance payment. So it could affect their rate, their eligibility for the weekly rate, which in that case we probably um, barring all the other uh, criteria met, we would uh, transfer that claim to uh, the PUA program. Uh, as far as continuing payments, uh, severance dismissal payment, Polly's right in New York, it does affect their eligibility to collect benefits. Um, there are provisions in the law we have to consider, but um, the uh, threshold is the maximum benefit rate for the state. So if any amount allocated to each week, whether it is allocated by the employer or us based on our calculation, 
that amount, weekly amount for the dismissal payment is more than our maximum benefit rate of 504, that claimant would not be eligible for that particular week. At the end of one evening, you're eligible after the, it, let's say you're, you're given a month of, of severance, you can then collect a full 26 weeks after that. It doesn't reduce your maximum benefit amount, um, that amount, and, and so you have that safety net for a full 26 weeks, and in this case, well, depending on the December 31st deadline, it'll, it'll be into the future. So it puts you on pause, uh, and then you resume once that pause is lifted. Right. Sonia, you were gonna uh, jump in on this, I think? Yeah, I was just going to say that the California application does ask if you expect to receive or have received some sort of additional payment that's not wages. And I believe that's the, the severance question. It also mentions holiday pay, vacation pay. So there is a place on the application that asks for that information I don't claim to be an expert on how that figures into the calculation. Paul and Rena just spoke to that, but things like severance pay, holiday pay, vacation pay, those things that are in addition to wages should be reported and they are figured into the calculation of a person's benefits. So and for, uh, I can speak briefly that I do not believe that accrued vacation and accrued sick pay an accrued holiday that you've already earned is calculated. I don't know about severance pay because it's a theory that's already you already earned it. Um, so I don't think it works against your future benefits in California. But again, you need to check. And for purposes of our members, uh, those of them who are working under ongoing contracts may be getting something that they'll that'll be called force majeure payments, which are contract essentially contract termination payments. Uh, our contract suspension payments, and likewise, those would be um, taken into account, as Sonia just described. Um, if we could, um, one of the topics we talked about yesterday in a prep session of this was how someone can figure out, if they have a choice, what state they should be filing their unemployment claim in. Um, and Judy, I'd like to turn to you, if I could, to kick off just a brief comment on how, what are the considerations that people should take in mind when deciding where to initiate their unemployment claim if they have a choice, if they've worked in multiple states, for example. Yeah, if any, as I said earlier, any state you worked in can take the claim and, and Paul provided additional information about the ways the states cooperate to, to aggregate income. Um, I would recommend that people look at those maximum benefit levels. Um, and again, you can just Google them very easily and, and figure out where there is the highest possible benefit level. Um, because, you know, it, it might, like if you're looking between D.C. and Maryland, for example, the jurisdictions I'm very familiar with, it's either 425 a week or 430 a week. So it, it doesn't make a big difference. But when you're talking about New Jersey, that's in the mid-700s, or Florida, that's at about 250 maximum a week. There's a huge difference there. So I think one of the things people should be looking to is, is in the states where they've worked, is there a big difference in maximum benefits? Um, and I would love to hear if Paul and Rena have any further information based on their expertise running the programs. You want to add anything, Rena? Trying to unmute. Um, yes, we do. Um, we, we strongly recommend that uh, if claimant can review the rates of different state and also some of the rules that apply for each state, that they follow that to make it easy for themselves so there's no delay. However, uh, the resigning state is uh, what we normally see as uh, you know, claims filing. In New York, we do have a process where uh, we do look at wages that were reported um, in other states, you know, where claimant worked in other states. And if there is a possibility for a combined wage claim, meaning wages from more than one state, more than New York, uh, we do send claimants uh, forms advising them what rates would be and allowing them the option to choose where they want. They want to file in New York using both states, let's say New York and New Jersey. We would tell them that the rate in New York would be 504. But if they went to New Jersey, again, combining both wages, they could have a different rate in New Jersey and they can make that decision on their own. So we kind of educate them to make the best decision for the higher rate 
Uh, they could also, um, again, research on their own if they have worked in more than one state. Sometimes though we do, um, if let's say someone files in New York and has worked only in California the entire 18 months, that would be an interstate claim they would have to file against California. So we would advise them if, if they get, you know, came through our system. Um, it's my understanding that um, the state is going to communicate with the applicant to some extent through the mail. That's how it's done in California. So if you are physically, at least, especially during this pandemic, if you're physically in California, and you use that as your address, you're gonna get mail at that address. If you are physically somewhere else and you file in California, your mail is going to go to that California address and you won't be able to, to get that mail. You won't be able to receive your mail because you're in a different state. So I don't know how people are going to be able to work that out. Um, California does coordinate benefits so if you are in California and you've worked in, sep in other states, California will work with those other states to coordinate your benefits. But for the purposes of that state communicating with you, they're going to communicate with you through that address that's placed in your application as your address of residence. So I don't know how you would apply if you were in California I don't know how you'd apply necessarily in New York. If New York, then I don't know how they would mail it to you. I don't know if they mail it to California or if they would only mail to you at a New York address. I don't know how that works. I don't know, Paul or Brina, would you like to address that? Brina, do you know? Yes, in New York, um, we have what we call out of state residents, meaning they have a New York claim, but they live in Florida. So once they provide the out of state residents mailing address, that's where communication goes. So, um, so for New York, really what we have on file is their mailing address, that's where the mail will go. Not okay, sure so you have two, there are two fields. One is your mailing address and one is your resident address. Correct but make sure you put in that address. <laughs> That's the issue. Sometimes we do have return mail and I, and we do have issues with, with uh, people then contacting and saying, I never got that information. So another question, uh, this one kind of unique to our membership, I think, but interesting. I, at least I find it interesting. Uh, we got a question from someone who said, I'm a child actor and I don't have a driver's license or ID number to put into my application. How do I apply for unemployment assurance, uh, unemployment assistance? Uh, Sonia, any idea on that in California? I have spoken to a number of parents of, of child performers, and the parents have made these applications on behalf of their minor performers children. Um, I don't know that um, they've been hampered by the fact that the child doesn't have a driver's license. So people are making those applications for their child, minor children. Parents are. Great, and I think it also goes back to what David said before, which is there will be a lot of these forms and online systems are not designed around our industry. So there will be times where you have to sort of figure out how best to answer a question that doesn't seem exactly relevant or where, so in this case, you know, if, if the you know, parent needs to put in their ID or if there's some other solution that helps move through the process, then obviously in a subsequent communication with the unemployment department, with EDD or with another state's unemployment department, they can clarify that information and, and provide it outside of this sort of fixed form that's obviously designed to just ingest massive amounts of information from the millions of claims that are being filed all at the same time right now. So um, that is great. We've got another question, uh, a clarification. Apparently, some people are understanding from what we're saying that residuals don't need to be reported as income when you're reporting your income to 
uh, as part of the unemployment process. I, that is not what we're saying, I'm pretty sure. Uh, if anyone here in the panel disagrees with it, then feel free to say so, but residuals do need to be reported. Our conversation was about whether residuals by themselves could trigger your eligibility if you haven't worked in a long time, um, let's say on set or worked in a physical working capacity, and you've only been receiving residuals for, say, 18 or 24 months. That was the conversation we were having, but they do need to be reported as income when you're signing up under penalty of perjury a report for your weekly income to um, your state unemployment office. Um, so, can, I, can I clarify yeah. something on that? Please. In New York, yes, thank you. In New York um, once the claimant has established the claim and they're certifying every week for benefits, if a certain week they have not performed any activities, they have not performed any work, but they did receive during that week residuals for work done prior weeks, that is what New York does not consider as a, an amount that would hold them ineligible. That is the part that they don't have to report. Um, and um, yeah, I want to just clarify that there in the initial application stage where you're first filling out the application, which is where a lot of calls that we're receiving where the applicants are, they're just filling out the initial application. There are two steps. You first have to have worked in those 18 months. So that's going to be your last employer. And then you're also going to see on your application, all these other employers and people tell me, those are my residuals. And I'm like, yes, report those residuals also in that initial application. So it's your last employer in the last 18 months. That's going to be the last employer field. And then all these other employers, yes, fill that out. That's going to go towards your eligibility and the calculation of benefits. That Those residual payments are important to report in your initial application. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Sonia. So in our last few minutes, I want to turn to what is arguably one of the more complicated topics, but I want to at least touch on it because we know that there are people on the call, on the webinar who are interested in it, uh, which is the question of loan outs. And one of the questions that we received was, how do I even apply for unemployment assistance with my loan out? Do I do it under the name of my loan out company? Do I do it under my own personal name? How do I actually uh, move forward with an application um, if I work mainly through a loan out. And I'm wondering, Judy, if you wanna start, kick off this conversation about that. I will definitely kick it off. Um, you, you cannot apply for unemployment insurance except as an individual. Companies can't get unemployment insurance. So you would apply for any of these benefits in your own name. I think the easiest answer are for those of you that treat yourselves as an employee of your loan out corporation and give yourself a W-2 with those wages on it. That's probably going to be the clearest case for getting state UI benefits. Um, second, I think if you uh, consider yourself self-employed and you are you know, the, the president, the CEO, the whatever of the, the loan out corporation and as incorporated, so to speak, um, then there's probably a fairly clear case for your eligibility for pandemic unemployment assistance. I'm still learning about all of this. I'm gonna turn it to, um, I think Sonia probably next to talk a little bit more in detail, but I, I know there are some of you that, that classify yourself in different ways um, and, and that this is a legal structure that has some fluidity to it that al it allows you to do things in good times that make the most financial sense for you that unfortunately might not result in the highest benefit level available in a bad time like this. And I, I do want to make sure that, and Sonia, I want you to address that, but I also want to make sure we, we note that there are also um, programs available outside of unemployment insurance that apply to small businesses. Um, there are SBA loans that can be forgiven if you maintain your employee, you know, if you don't lay any employees off during a mm -hmm. period of time and things like that. So if you are running a loan out as a business, um, as opposed to basically just a pass-through entity for your own earnings, then there may be other programs that you need to consider that are outside of the realm of the unemployment insurance system, but which still might actually provide significant benefit to you. And we have and will add resources to that uh, regarding that 
on the sag after resource page. Sonia, can you address the question as it relates maybe to loan outs, um, maybe the type of loan outs, the sort of traditional type of loan out where really there are no other employees, there's just the individual who is working through that entity um, and the scenarios that we frequently see. Yes, in my understanding, and I'm not a corporate attorney, I am not a tax attorney. It is my understanding that in California, if your loan out exists only um, to provide your services as an actor, that you may apply for unemployment benefits. If you have other employees that work under that corporation, or if you also have um, some other business whose you know, revenue is passing through that corporation, then you cannot use that corporation to apply for your unemployment insurance. It has to only be a loan out for your services as an actor. That's my understanding of how it works in California. If you have a loan out corporation, um, some people I've spoken to have S Corps, some people have C Corps, <laughs> Some people pay themselves with a W-2. Some people don't pay themselves with a W-2. Some people pay themselves weekly. Some are monthly, some are quarterly, some is random. Um, those are the questions that I can't answer. I don't know how you then report your, your wages on your unemployment insurance application. If you have a if W-2s and you've paid yourself some money through your loan out corporation, you've actually paid yourself a W-2 income, then your loan out is your employer and you are an employee. And those W-2 wages are what you report. I don't understand or know enough to give advice if let's say your loan out corporation has lots of money in it and you're going to keep paying yourself even after you get your unemployment benefits. I don't know if that is an offset weekly um, after you get your unemployment benefits that offsets what you receive um, from unemployment insurance. Um, I do believe your unemployment, your loan out has to have paid your unemployment insurance in order for you to use it as your employer. Some people don't pay their unemployment insurance premiums through their loan outs. Some people do. So that's why I suggest that people talk to their financial professional, their tax attorney, their accountant to see how they are using their loan out because I can't see that. I don't know how your loan out works. So you're gonna have to find out what's been done with your loan out, how you're paying yourself, are you using the same bank account that your loan out has and just taking money out randomly? Or are you actually paying yourself as a W-2 employee and that money uh -huh. is in a separate pot, not commingled with your loan out company's money? Those are questions you're gonna have to figure out through your accountant or your tax attorney. And I'm sure that will impact how you're going to report this this income and how you're going to fill out the application. Thanks, Sonia. I think that's so true. I'll come in just one second to you, but just it's so true that there are so many different ways that our members work through loan out companies. So we really want to encourage everybody to talk to their accountant, like Sonia said, talk to your lawyer who helps set up your loan out for you um, and make sure those advisors are helping you work through this because how you use it and how you structured it can make a huge difference. Um, Judy, we want to jump in on that. I would just note that if for any reason I, 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 you can't speak to your advisors right now, or for example, you can't afford their hourly fees, most state bar associations have free clinics for small businesses. I am sure the California State Bar has one. So you should check their website as well and see what kind of resources they have. And, and what they have is corporate attorneys from all over the state who are willing to do pro bono business for small, pro bono advice for small businesses and they may be able to help you figure it out as well. That's a great suggestion. Can I, Duncan, David, was that you, I Jay? Just take up, just take, Duncan mentioned something that's very important. There are other provisions of the CARES Act that might benefit 
a loan out company. It's called the Paycheck Protection Program, which theoretically could provide eight weeks of additional pay to an employee. You need to talk to your advisor about that. Emergency injury disaster loans, the IDL, their employment tax credits. There may be other ways to get money, check into PPP, the IDL, ETC. Um, it's another aspect of this that may supplement your income. Thank you for that. So I think what, uh, unless Paul or Rena, you want to indicate there's any different answer on behalf of New York um, on that I question. Think, no. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I would just say generally, um, and I know I've talked, it's been a little while but with, with some of the industry about loan outs, but generally speaking, if you have a corporation set up and you're a corporate officer, um, you are covered by the unemployment insurance um, in New York. And you are eligible for benefits. Um, the, the key for, for us is that if you are working and continuing to operate your corporation and can do it um, from home, then you, would, you potentially are not ineligible. But if you are working and just doing some minimal amount of work because everything is shut down, and in this case, you are the corporation, right? Because <laughs> you're not acting. Um, we only reduce your benefits by any work you do on any day by 25%. So if, if you did one day of work, you'd get 75% of your benefit rate. Um, LLC members and partners are not eligible um, in different structures. But Rena, anything else you, you agree? I think they got it. Yes, yes, basically. basically we look at it. Yeah, the uh, ongoing activities during the week is what we look for. Uh, there's also another part to it. Uh, if uh, someone does close the business in anticipation of not being able to survive this environment, uh, we do have another part of it that we look at. They might not be uh, involved in any activities, but we need to look at the reason why they closed. And so we consider that pretty much as a voluntary quitting the business. But under these circumstances, most likely they would be eligible because they would have good cause to close the business. Great, thank you for that. We're gonna just go to our uh, final takeaways for everybody now, because we, we know there's been a ton of information. We could actually keep going probably for another couple of hours on this webinar, if not more, but uh, we definitely want, especially Paul and Rena, to be able to get back to <laughs> their work, uh, helping make sure this program is moving forward in New York. Here are some of the key takeaways that we want everyone who's been on this uh, webinar to sort of keep in mind. Number one, file your unemployment application as soon as possible with the possible exception that Judy mentioned earlier, if you are only eligible uh, outside of employment for that pandemic unemployment assistance, you might wanna wait and watch the state website to see when that program is up and running just to make sure your application doesn't get lost in the shuffle. But for most people who are filing a traditional unemployment application, you should go ahead and file it ASAP. You should choose the best state to file in for you. We talked a little bit about how to do that. You should include all your income that's arguably eligible, and then you can work through the details of that as the state uh, processes your unemployment claim. Please be persistent with overwhelmed systems. As everyone's talked about, this is an uh, extraordinary time. The massive quantity of applications that are being filed are overwhelming for many of the states that are trying to process them. So you may just have to be persistent. You may have to go back and check the website every day or make phone calls repeatedly. That may be what you have to do to get the benefit that you are entitled to. You should document everything that you're submitting. If you can, screenshot it, make a PDF of it, whatever, so that you have it for your records in the event you need to go back to it later. Please take advantage of the resources and assistance that are out there for you. We have the resource page, and I'm gonna put the link for that up in just a second but we have a sag after resource page that has a ton of links and a ton of documents and information for you to look at. Uh, we will add more based on the conversation that we just had, and we'll also add some FAQs um, for the questions that we weren't able to get to um, during this time. And finally, if you have a complicated or special situation, ask your tax advisor, your lawyer, the union. Judy made the great point that there are bar association resources. We'll put some links to those up on our page as well. I know there's several in the Los Angeles area, for example. Um, the California Lawyers for the Arts and Public Council have exactly the type of programs that Judy was talking about. So we'll put those resources up for you um, on the resource page, which is uh, going to now, hopefully, appear, there we go, is now going to 
up here on the screen. Um, there are lots of resources out there, but what we're trying to do is provide you one place to go where you can find links to the other resources that you might need, and that's sagaftra.org slash COVID-19. You can put the dash in or not, either way it works, and that will take you to our COVID-19 resource page. On the left, there's a tab for unemployment. There's other resources there available as well, like emergency assistance programs and various other types of things that we didn't have time to get into today that people might need to access uh, as part of just making sure that you can um, take care of yourself and we can all take care of each other during this incredibly challenging time. I do wanna just take a moment before I turn it back over to Gabrielle to give my extreme appreciation to all of our panelists. You were fantastic. Um, I especially wanna thank Paul and Rena from the New York State Department of Labor. I know they're working frantically to try and just move everything forward as quickly as possible. And uh, Judy applauded you earlier and we all do for the amazing progress that you have made. But I also do wanna thank Judy Conti from the National Employment Law Project, David Rosenfeld from Weinberg, Roger and Rosenfeld, and Sonia Augustine from here in our own SAG After Legal Department. Sonia, thank you so much for being part of this. Um, we couldn't have uh, done this without you all. And um, we look forward to continuing um, future programming through the PTEOE. Um, thank you, Gabrielle, for sponsoring this panel so that we could put it on and get this information out to the members. Um, Duncan, first of all, thank you really for setting this up and, and, and moderating this way. And I do want to also reiterate to the panelists, it is so meaningful to us as members to be able to hear how it works. Clearly, this is evolving. I mean, even as we're hearing the conversation, there's discoveries being made because it's a whole new program. And I, I want people to know that we will be actually holding a follow-up webinar uh, in the near future because there's still a lot to be answered and a lot that will be discovered in the next just couple of days as it's all being uh, reviewed. So I hope that you will join us again. Just so you all know, uh, you are watching us on the SAG-AFTRA site on YouTube. So please sign up, subscribe on that site. You can get notifications then when we're doing further other uh, webinars, as I said, we'll be doing. You'll get notifications for that and other things as the PTOE, the President's Task Force, as we reach out with communications on different aspects of what we're going and working through in terms of COVID-19 and how we're trying to help uh, the members. I, I wanna say to all of you who are watching, uh, you know, again, this is really a challenging time. And to say it's any less than that would be untrue. So in knowing that, we want you to know we're here for you, we support you, we want the best for everybody, and we will continue searching and finding ways to help. Um, it is all of us together. And that is how we will move forward. And we will, again, we will come out of this and we will come out together. So thank you very much and take care of yourself, stay healthy. Mm -hmm.